<laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It depends on when you're listening. We are the solution. Nothing changes if we change nothing. We're the New York City Prevention Resource Center. Uh, we're funded by OASIS, the Office of Addiction Supports and Services. And I'm Ronnie Katz. And you are? Sure, Francis. Yeah, that's my birth name. That's my given name. That's my name. Yeah. <laughs> and hopefully I, I said their name right. The Offices of Addiction Services and Supports. Yeah. It, it changed last year. And I'm still like in the old head, you know. It's, it's, but the cool thing is that so many substance misuse um, agencies now don't say abuse anymore. Yes, misuse of the word, which I think is a better, we all think it's a better word. Well, most of it, I don't want to say everyone, because sometimes we're stuck in certain vocabulary that we're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. It's okay to change your vocabulary and, 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 and understand the use of new words and why they're being used. It's, it's like, yep. it's misuse, it's not abuse, you know, do you like, understand the definition of abuse and use, misuse, I think is an important part. Well, removing the stigma is so important, and there's already so much stigma stigma around substance use and addiction. And um, you know, it's, as as a person in long term recovery, I, I've experienced that in so many realms, uh, even on a professional realm, trying to uh, to find a building to start a recovery center in Portland, Maine, and and having a prospective landlord say to me, "I don't want those people here," and me looking at him and saying, "Oh, you mean people like me?" And seeing his face just fall, but you know, stigma, stigma is such a poisonous, toxic uh, emotion. If, if I want to even call it emotion, a label. Or what, do, what do we call stigma? It's so horrible. I don't know. I mean, and I always talk about that's the one word that growing up we we heard. I mean, me as a as a as a, as a black man, uh, as a teen, I heard the word stigma. I heard the word stereotype a lot. I'm being targeted because of the, the color of my skin, because of where I grew up. Like the one thing, you know, or, oh, you speak so well. Like, what does that mean? Right. You don't, <laughs> you don't sound black. I don't sound like, what is that? I don't understand what that, what, have you met other black people? <laughs> like, I, I know. What that means. I, like, oh, you don't look gay. Yeah. Like, what is it? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> right. Because you can't identify like that that adage, don't judge a book by its cover. You got to open the book and read the pages. You have to mm -hmm. get to know the individual. And even if so, what the person has has a different skin tone to you, to you. So what the person that you know loves someone of the same sex. So what? So what? Someone has a different religion of you. So what? The the point is is to to get to know and understand. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm not saying so what to put the person, the individuals down. I'm saying like it shouldn't affect your livelihood. It shouldn't stop you from being who you are. Or stop you from understanding that, that everyone here is a human. Exactly. Um, but which, I mean, we as a society are so quick to put labels on people. When I used to work in the schools um, and, and I would be getting a new student to work with, I would say, don't tell me. I don't want to know much about them because... You, I don't. I don't want them to be labeled when they come to me. I want to get to know them for who they are, uh, because so often a student will get in trouble in the school system, and that follows them throughout their their career in school, and they're labeled. That stigma is is attached to them. It's even the the positive labeling sometimes is tricky. You know, yeah. when we tell kids, "Oh, you're smart." What does that mean? You have to attach a definition to you know behind it. Me being a dad. I, I praise my kids all the time, but I also tell them why I praise them because they, because they, those words sometimes lose value. Because you can say to your yeah. son, daughter, whomever, uh, "Oh my God, you're, you're such a bright person." What do you mean? I look yellow? What <laughs> 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 oh, that means? Explain to me what that. What do you mean by being bright? You're so smart today. What about yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true. Yeah, I never thought of it like that. But the words we say have so much power. Absolutely. So, I mean, you have to be, you know, I had uh, one of my former staff, she passed away and I, I said something to her. What did I say to her? Same, same thing about, um, how I, I told her, how, like, she's a strong individual, like, very strong. And it's like we had a personal relationship, like, she actually shared with me, she kind of said she was upset by me telling her that. And I'm like, why? She said, because everyone keeps telling me I'm strong. Because she was, she was, she was on, she was, um, had like a few months to live, what have you. And then people kept saying she's strong. And she didn't understand why they were saying she's strong. So I, you know, I'm glad she explained, she told me how she felt. So I explained to her why I felt that she was strong. 
So she actually actually said to me, thank you. Because you're the one person that took the time to say, all right, you know, I'm going to say, and Mariah, you're, you're, you're strong because of this. Because you, you that, it's not only about the fact that you are, you know, fighting, you know, this disease, what have you. It's the fact that you're in school. You're doing all these other things. Because she said people kept focusing on her sickness, her illness. She's like, dude, I do other things. Like, let me let me right. live and be myself. I'm like, I'm like, I said, you know me very well. I'm about letting you be you. Like, you know, I'm here for you and whatever, whatever you need. And she said, that's why I told you it bothered me because I know you would tell me mm. what I need to hear. Well, you are definitely someone who always speaks truth. And uh, that's one of the things I love about you. Thank you. Well, but before I forget, too, it's June 2nd. Happy Pride. Yes, yes, yes. Happy Pride. It's Pride, Pride Month. Pride. Yes, yes, yes. Happy Pride Month. So any, any plans? I know the city's open. Like, what does that look like? I know we're doing some posts for NYC Pop. Uh, we have some posts this week and so forth, uh, but as far as uh, the entire month, but any 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 plans, any you know events? Not for me, okay. but it never. I mean, years ago we used to go to we used to go to Pride in um, in Portland, Maine, because we used to be vendors there. And one year I played okay. music there. Um, but for me, it's enjoying the life that I can now have. The yes. fact that I can be married and um, I can get many of the same things that people who are um, heterosexual get, even though mm -hmm. there's a lot of things we still can't get uh, because mm -hmm. marriage is not, does not equal uh, equity. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. just being able to stay home and spend a life with my spouse mm -hmm. and know that it's legal and, mm -hmm. and we wait a long time for that to happen, that for me is celebrating pride. No, just enjoying the everyday stuff. I think it's great that every individual is able to find someone they love, no matter who they are, and you know, and have the ability to be, to be married. Like, like, if you love the person, like, why can't you be with that person? Why can't you marry that person? If that's the choice you want to be, because marriage isn't there for everyone. But if the person wants to spend, if they want to spend the rest of their lives, like, how, again, back to my point earlier, how does that bother you? How does it impact who you are? You don't have to live with them. You know, right. you don't have to live with me. You don't have to live around like you do. <laughs> <Dude. laughs> well, if, you, if you're against gay marriage, then don't marry somebody gay. Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 she, like Ryan didn't ask you to marry. <laughs> like, dude, like, let, let people be. Let them be human. And I, and I say that over and over, man. Like, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be, you know, held accountable because of what you want to do with your life. Unless it's the only time I, the only time I kind of say something is when it's a detriment to who's around you and yourself. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's like, I'm not going to put you down because it's detriment. I'm like, how can I uplift you? How can I say, you know what, this is going to hurt if not you, someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, and if that's, if that's the path you want to take, like just be mindful of, you know, the repercussions. Because repercussions also comes from happiness. I want to mm -hmm. be very clear. I want to be clear on that also. Repercussions doesn't only come from, from doing bad things. It comes from doing, well, quote, unquote, bad things. It comes from doing, quote, unquote, good things. So, you know, there's always, there's, there's always going to be repercussions in some shape or form. And how do you deal with it? How do you accept it? You know, because, like I said, happiness, people are upset that you're happy. Like, people are upset that you're married and happy, Ronnie. Like, <laughs> you know what? It's their problem. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but I hate to do this to you. Yeah, but we have someone knocking on our door. It happens. So let's let them in. I hear our doorbell and our guest is arriving. It's usually when Shavar is speaking. Absolutely. That's a thing. I'm used to it. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Steve. Hi, good afternoon. Good How afternoon. are you? Good. How are you doing? Just fine, thanks. Doing well. It's always good to see you and see the Thank smile you. on your face. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, and uh, one of the nice things about retirement is it becomes a lot easier to smile when you don't have to <laughs> worry about uh, getting on a commuter train and heading into the office every morning anymore. Hi. Hey, yeah, we're about to experience that again pretty soon. So, right. but b before we, we get into that, um, welcome to the solution. Nothing changes if we change nothing. And uh, if, maybe you could take a moment to introduce yourself and tell our listeners and our viewers who you are and, you know, what you do. Sure. Okay. I'm Steve Rabinowitz. I uh, live in, in White Plains, New York. And um, 
uh, worked for the New York, what's now the New York State Office of Addiction Services and Supports for 30 years. It went through several name changes during my tenure. Uh, the last 12 years I was there, I served as the director of downstate field operations, overseeing funding and program services for New York City and Long Island. Um, I was happily able to retire from that position after uh, my 30 years in the end of 2016. And since then, I've been working as an addiction services consultant uh, and as an uh, advocate in the uh, uh, around areas of drug policy and so forth. So I've uh, got, gotten to enter into a whole new phase of my life. Which is wonderful. I mean, you worked a lot of years in that field and, and you deserve to be able to, to do what you're doing now. But you have always been somebody who has been so supportive in my work and in the work we do. And I, I just want you to know how much I've always appreciated that from day one. Mm -hmm. uh, you had my back and, you know, you, you really helped us a lot in, in the growth of the PRC and, mm -hmm. you know, and also in, in one of our best coalitions. I, I don't want to say best because that's a judgment. <laughs> one of our strongest coalitions, uh, WEPA. Yes. Uh, no. Because of you, we connected with them. Mm -hmm. Well, they're great people at WEPA. And, you know, I, I, I one of the things, mm -hmm. and thank you for saying all that. Uh, I always had a very strong passion for um, prevention work. Uh, I think it's very critical, uh, especially as a, not only as a professional and uh, someone who works in the field, but as a parent. Uh, you know, I got fortunate, was fortunate enough to raise two children who have done very well and uh, had very few issues with, but you know, I, I saw other kids falling by the wayside. Same thing of my own generation. You know, I grew up in the late 60s and early 70s and you know, lost friends along the way. Uh, one of the reasons I have a very strong passion for the work. And uh, I know the importance of preve prevention with regard to addressing issues around uh, risk and uh, resiliency and so forth. And particularly, uh, one of the things I've spoken about a lot with uh, folks in recent years is the whole issue of uh, the importance of prevention work in addressing some of the issues around childhood trauma or what's often called adverse childhood experiences and that uh, we really need to provide a lot of caring and support to those young people uh, to keep them from uh, uh, becoming involved with problem substance use. Yeah, that, I mean, that's such a great point too. I, you know, I remember when we started looking at the trauma um, and now of course it's the buzzword. And mm -hmm. uh, Shavar and I always have a really um, interesting conversation about that because, you know, in this field, there's always a lot of terms and buzzwords and we didn't define that until really recent years, the last, I guess, decade, decade, and maybe 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. But um, I would like to hear Shafar's story about what trauma meant growing up in Harlem. So, mm -hmm. so and I always share this story, like trauma, I think, because I bring it up in a lot of our meetings, and it's, it's like, like Ronnie said, buzzwords, uh, it's a buzzword, and also the intent around vocabulary. And we use certain words that a lot of people aren't familiar with. And the word like trauma was something I wasn't particularly familiar with growing up as a child. And when, I mean, in, in a sense of, of, of any type of mental capacity or, or, or something that, that affected me adversely in my neighborhood. And I heard the word trauma is when I went to the emergency room, you know, blunt first trauma, you know, trauma to the leg. Like that's, that, that word wasn't, you know, given to us, you know, well, at least to me as a child explained to me, you know, the other word that we always use is stigma. That's the word I did know. This is connected to stereotype. This is connected to judgment. So growing up hearing, you know, not hearing it and hearing it now. And then when I hear it being used loosely as if everyone knows, knows what this is, I'm like, be very mindful of the community you go into because this word is still relatively new to some of us, not all of us, but to some of us. When you go in there, ask them what do they know about trauma? Because you might meet someone like me who is educated, but still will say, when I grew up, it was about going to the hospital. <laughs> it was about a contusion to the leg, <laughs> what have you. Like it was about, you know, some sort of a, a you know, emergency room visit, not, you know, uh, any, any, anything else. And then you brought up something about trauma in youth and in, 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 in choice or substance misuse. And I want to, I want to hear what, like, in a, in a, in a, I don't want to say perfect world, because perfect is a, is a, is a, mm. it's a sort of thing. <laughs> What, what would be an ideal situation or that you can share with providers or parents or families to help with young people who may be learning about trauma, families who are learning about trauma to, or, or 
may may approach trauma some way uh, down the down the line, and how can they support each other? Whether it's the families, the child, or mm -hmm. you know, I know it's a loaded question. No, it's an excellent question, Shavar. Uh, first of all, I think that you made a really good point. Is first of all, people have to really understand that trauma, as exactly that, is not about all about physical injury, but certainly about about you know psychic and emotional injury as well. And I think one of the things we have to be very uh, cognizant of is the whole issue of historic and psychic trauma to communities of color. Not being a person of color myself, but knowing that uh, the experience of African American people and of Hispanic and uh, Asian people coming to this country um, uh, involved in was incredible levels of trauma around racism, uh, institutionalized racism, uh, personal experience of uh, uh, impoverishment and so forth uh, where, where that uh, happens. So it's very important to know that and that to factor that in to how we approach young people and to be, be very well aware of it. Um, I think that, you know, as following our uh, current prevention model, one of the things we want to look at is A, to, of course, to examine and understand and help the young person to you know, feel comfortable with speaking about uh, how they experienced the trauma and what it meant to them. Uh, and also to offer them the kind of support and build on their strengths and look at the uh, degrees of resiliency. We know we see uh, some young people who can go through hell and back and they come out quite well and they do they do amazing things. Uh, some people, some young people are much more affected by it. And we have to know each uh, child and offer them the type of individual support and programming, the things that will uh, help them build on that resiliency, you know, rewards for there's, you know, doing pro-social behaviors in their school or the communities, uh, support and under and, and recognition of their autonomy and individuality, I think is also critical not to, uh, you know, lump them in and you say, well, all kids do this, all kids that. No, this child does this, this child does that. And uh, I remember I had conversations with uh, folks about, uh, well, you know, let's say all kids, you know, uh, in high school drink, or all kids do this. I'd say, no, some do, uh, many do, and many do, and they ultimately come out fine, but uh, there, are some, there are many who don't too. And uh, we have to be, it's not, a, it's not automatic just because one is in a situation that one reacts to it one way or another. So it's, uh, it's being aware of uh, uh, the other person's and respecting the other person's individuality as well as offering them the kind of uh, supports and services that they need to, uh, to grow up and uh, live a, uh, a healthy and uh, happy uh, life as, uh, as adults. Those are great points. And you mentioned resilience. And that's something that I've, I've seen throughout my career because um, I used to run after school programs. And same with Shavar. <laughs> I did that in Nashville, Tennessee. And prior to that, I was a SAPIS counselor in the New York City public schools, a SPARC counselor. And for those eight years, I was a SPAR counselor. I saw kids who had been exposed to so much trauma that it was amazing that they even walked the earth, that they were able to have a conversation and function. Um, and still many of them excel. Uh, and what I was finding, so many people had given up on them, but when a child has a positive adult in their life who believes in them, even if it's three weeks during the summer, you go down to see grandma or Nana down South um, every year, it builds such resilience in young people. And there's so many studies that support that. So uh, I don't think that people realize how important it is to have that mm -hmm. presence in a child's life. And that's why the after school programs are so important because then we can get to become that presence. So now all these years later, it's 20, I left New York in 97. So 24 years later, I left all my spark kids. Some of them are grandparents, <laughs> young grandparents, <laughs> uh, but most of them have made it. Mm -hmm. And these were the young people that everybody gave up on and said, oh, no, they're the tough cases. They won't make it. Years later, we've reconnected on social media. And so many times they'll say, you know, it took me a while, but I'll never forget the things that you taught me or how much you believed in me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Shamar and I talk about this stuff all the time, how we never realize. And that's why prevention can be so thankless at times because we don't see the results mm -hmm. right away. It's not like you're in treatment that you can have a treatment plan and you can have real measurable results. In prevention, it could take decades, right. but I've seen it. I have the evidence and it's just so compelling and so fulfilling. And that's what gives me my passion in this field. 
No, you're absolutely right, Ronnie. And, uh, you know, one of the issues that you just pointed to is that, you know, we live in a world where more and more we want to look at things like uh, outcome measures and uh, efficacy and so forth. And that's very reasonable because we're looking at uh, public funds and how they're spent and how those resources are utilized. Uh, and certainly it's challenging enough in a treatment environment where you have people in front of you because, you, you know, it's difficult to measure how folks may be doing three years, five years, 10 years down the road uh, after an episode of intervention or treatment. It becomes even more difficult with prevention. You can, you can look at things like, you know, how well the uh, young people who received the services responded to them. Uh, did they seem to gain knowledge and gain understanding? And that's uh, you know, a good measure in and of itself, but you're absolutely right that uh, uh, the, 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 true proof, the pr true proof of the pudding is uh, what happens to them, you know, 10 and 20 years down the road. And that's a, a very challenging uh, issue to measure. Uh, but what we can look at is also the impact that, uh, you know, the prevention work has on communities as a whole. And do we see uh, you know, the strengths being built in those communities and the uh, institutions and resources being built to help support young people along the way. How can we help? Because, like, I'm listening and all that. We, I mean, this is a general question. Uh, within having young people or people who are in adverse uh, communities understand that they might be dealing with trauma. Because growing up, again, like, back to what I was saying earlier, we don't know that we're dealing with trauma. We just know that that's the situation yeah. that we're sure. living in. Like, you know, not having food. That's, oh, that happens, you know, because yeah. my neighbor dealt, my neighbor dealt with it. My, my friend dealt with it. Oh, not having clean clothes or not, ha you know, or not having a job or not having, a, or, or police stopping you. They, every mm -hmm. kid, I'm one of those kids who had the story of a, at the age of 16, I pray this is happening to my son. I pray, I pray, I pray at the age of 16 being stopped by, by cops with guns drawn on me. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to have, that's trauma. Mm -hmm. And that is like, and, and again, I don't, I didn't know that's trauma. I knew, I knew, I just knew at 16, that was going to happen to me. <laughs> right. Like that's like, how do we help with that? How do we, you know, help define that and help get through that? Because some of us think that's just the way of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's that, you know, and that's, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the very uh, unfortunate things is that to what extent, again, and particularly in, in communities that have been uh, most severely impacted by, uh, 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 injustice is that uh, trauma often becomes normalized and it becomes uh, accepted as well. That's just you know exactly the way of life. You know, my wife and I have been, been doing some um, uh, genealogy research and her particularly, and you know you come across the stories of our uh, family members who uh, survived the Holocaust and how they dealt with it, and uh, uh, to what extent uh, the you know, violence and hatred around them during that period of time became normalized. Uh, and uh, how do you get people, when, once it's over, how do you get to realize is that, no, what, what happened to you is not normal. It's, it's not what should have happened. It's not normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't, and you should never blame yourself for the circumstances that are around you. You're responsible for how you deal with it and how you grow, but you had no control over the things that uh, happened to you. As you talk about being a young you know, African-American man being confronted by the police at age 16, probably nothing you did to provoke that, but we know uh, that institutionalized racism often leads to those sort of situations. And, uh, uh, you know, I was, my children fortunately never had to deal with those issues, uh, but had, you know, under different times and different circumstances, they may well have. And, you know, um, I know that knowing a lot of, you know, uh, parents, uh, African-American and Hispanic parents of my generation that uh, how many of them talk about uh, having to have the talk with their young men and women about uh, how do you deal with the police in those situations and, you know, what do you do uh, and how dang potentially dangerous they are. Uh, it's hard for me almost to imagine what it would have been like for my kids to have to grow up with that. But, uh, you know, thankfully, uh, someone like you, you know, grew up and got to understand it. And now you're doing the work that you do. And that's, that's amazing stuff. So true. Very true. And, you know, I think when I think about it, too, it just, uh, you know, I grew up with the whole thing about the Holocaust, too. And, and my mother didn't even want me to get a Volkswagen when I was in college. <laughs> she said she was adamant to get me. I, I got my way. Right. Uh, but <laughs> broke down a lot. But, sure. you know, she didn't even want me to get a German car. And I didn't understand at the time. But then 
but I suffered a lot of anti-Semitism in my neighborhood growing up and uh, mm. some really traumatic stuff. But again, I had a really powerful, strong adult in my life, my mom, and she got helped me get through it. But it, sure. I mean, you know, I did follow the road to addiction. Uh, so it obviously affected me as well as genetics because addiction runs strong in my family. Uh, but even today, when I'm watching some of the things that are currently happening in our country, it triggers me. And I get that whole feeling again about, you know, when I'd hear about the Holocaust, uh, you know, or just even watching a movie about it, it just, I, I feel such a, a, a deep pain inside of me. Um, you know, watching the January 6th insurrection, it just reminded me of all of that and, and how dangerous a place this world is for people who are stigmatized, who are labeled. I mean, I always joke, when people come to my door um, doing what I call door-to-door -door religion, uh, my wife will say, don't, please be nice. And I'll go to the door and say, hi, I'm a Jewish lesbian in recovery. Um, mm. I don't think we have anything in common. And I usually send them <laughs> on their way. <laughs> right. But the, the fact of the matter is that I'm labeled and I am stigmatized in that area. Um, sure. So when, when I see this stuff happening, I, I'm reminded that nothing should be taken for granted. There's still a lot of people who believe that. And we still have a lot of work to do. And it, 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 in my case, it empowers me. It makes me want to work harder. And it wants me to spread more good energy and to you know, develop, develop resilience in people and develop protective factors. We were talking about that this morning with WEPA, how really all work, as much as we want to reduce the risk factors, it happens by increasing the protective factors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, we talked about something called the Positive Tickets Project. And that's something that I did years ago in Portland, Maine, where the police, community police give young people tickets, and I put quotes around that, mm -hmm. for doing something right. When they stumble upon somebody, a young person who's doing something positive, they give, you, you're getting a ticket. And mm -hmm. usually their eyes bug open and they get the ticket and it's a voucher for something really fun. So wow. we're looking, we'd like to see something like that, um, you know, developed in the Bronx and begin that healing because that's the gateway to the relationship between law enforcement and young people. And we certainly do need to do a lot of healing there. So mm -hmm. we were talking about that this morning, how important it is to build those protective factors in young people. Right. No, yeah, that, does, uh, that sounds like a, a very interesting uh, way to approach things. You know, the whole question about the role of law enforcement, you know, now is being very hotly debated in our society. Uh, particularly in our own field around dealing around addiction services. I happen to be someone who uh, very strongly believes in um, uh, decriminalization. I think that the whole approach of dealing with uh, substance use disorders by um, uh, arresting people and locking them up, uh, just we've seen it just hasn't worked. You know, we've had 50 years or more of the quote unquote war on drugs. Uh, what it's led to is mass incarceration, a terrible impact on communities of color in the society and so forth. Um, at the same token, there are areas where, you know, the law enforcement can, can play a very positive role, like that's what you're mentioning. And I think if, if our uh, law enforcement officers who are part of the community are more engaged with that than worrying about, you know, we're arresting someone because they've got a bag of dope or a, a dirty syringe in their pocket, uh, it will benefit everybody. I think the police will be able to do their job better the communities will feel more secure about it. And knowing that uh, uh, the officers are really there about to, to promote public safety and not just to uh, make arrests and uh, make, make their quotas. But, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of the you know, amount of resources and time that our society spends in uh, uh, the criminal justice system, um, uh, basically prosecuting people for having whether you want to call it a disease a biopsychosocial disorder whatever whatever term works for you the issue becomes you know how should we best approach it yeah you know, i think of myself for instance a little bit of disclosure disclosure i'm a person with uh type 2 diabetes and uh nobody uh uh you know uh you know, comes to my door and uh uh says well we saw you at the Krispy Kreme donut shop the other day and we're gonna have to uh uh, take you to jail because you're uh, not taking good care of your your illness, and uh, we don't we don't lock people up for doing that. So um, why would why are we dealing with substance use disorders any differently than we deal with a whole host of disorders that also have tremendous impact on society in terms of co costs and uh, use of resources and so forth? 
Um, I think, you know, you're a, you are a very living example of how recovery is a uh, great thing. And uh, we should be able to get people to uh, move toward recovery because it will benefit their lives and because they know they can uh, live healthier and better rather than be doing it out of because they're fear, they're fear of uh, negative consequences with the criminal justice system. Hey, Shavar, you look like you had a question. No, I was just going to say, um, there's, there's the whole trauma thing. <clears throat> there's trauma within, I, I believe, within the police force, you know, and I believe there's trauma within, you know, people who are connected to, because I want to be very clear, all my experiences were not bad with police officers. Mm -hmm. sure. I want to be very clear. Mm -hmm. my, my very first interaction with the police officer, I was seven years old. It was an officer named Officer Fox. He used to, he was a beat walker. He used to come throughout, jump through our neighborhood and played football with us. You know, we would play football mm -hmm. in the, on the side where we're tiny kids. He would throw the football around with us. That was my first experience with the officer. So I want to be very clear. I don't want people like, oh, you don't like cops because of what you went through. It happened, you know, and unfortunately, I'm saying it happened because that's how I'm taught to say it, it happened. When I shouldn't say it, it just happened, you know. But I, I, again, that was my first experience, and therefore, after the experiences weren't too pleasant. But I think part of it is the when you're in a system, and this isn't for all police officers. When you're in a system, you kind of fall into place, and you you act accordingly. You know, not, and this isn't every officer. You know, you act as if for those of them who who do, they act accordingly opposed to what their fears are. Because I actually had a conversation with a police officer. In his explanation was, I'm here to protect myself, first and foremost. So when he said that to me, I was like, oh, okay, so it's, it's not to protect me, it's to protect you. So you're constantly in fear of, for you, but, you know, but what are you in fear of? That was my question. But we didn't really get to, get to that point, to, get to that point. But as far as everyone else, the, you know, to your point, instead of, like, why can't we help people with it? Is there no money in helping people? Is that what it is? <laughs> mm -hmm. is, is no money is there no money in 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 treatment or recovery or or or, or prevention like these things are meaningful you know and ronnie mentioned this uh, not so long ago earlier about us running after school programs in in and we always talk about like that the, the time from three to six is a time where kids get in the most trouble because parents are at work Mm -hmm. You know, why take away, that's, and that's prevention. And Ronnie always tell me, you were doing prevention this entire time. I didn't realize that. I thought I was running out the school. <laughs> <laughs> but I was doing prevention. I was giving our, our youth opportunity to take archery, to take cooking, to take painting classes, to take salsa, to learn basketball, to learn uh, Olympic-style handball, to learn these different, and these are opportunities that they wouldn't normally get during the school day. You know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and also to Ronnie's point earlier, there's no instant gratitude in, this, in that type of work, even in this type of work. You, you meet these young people five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years from, from later. And like I always laugh, it's like they'll have full beards or their parents and they come up to you and say, thank you, Mr. Shavar. You have no clue who they are. Sure. <laughs> and you just say thank you right back and you walk away and you, you have this mental Rolodex of people that you met, met in your past and you're trying to figure out who they are. But you made an impact. I've had parents who came to me who, had, who still had my number and text me and said, thank you so much for telling my child this one thing. Because they still harp on that one thing you said to them that resonated 12 years later. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's quite all right. Now, you know, it's interesting, again, talking about the whole issue of the relationship with law enforcement. My dad was a, an attorney and spent a portion of his career doing criminal defense. And I remember growing up hearing stories, some of which I probably wasn't meant to hear. Uh, I would talk to my mom about some of the things he had to deal with, which were, you know, police who beat the confessions out of uh, prisoners, who lied on the stand, all sorts of things. But, you know, I never heard my dad condemn the police in general. He just said, look, there are some, there are some uh, unfortunate uh, individuals who, you know, similar to the officer you were talking about, who think it's their job to protect themselves first, not to protect society. But the key isn't so much the individuals, it's what the institutions and the values of the institutions that uh, really set the tone. If we, you know, in an uh, organization like uh, police, a police department or in a community or society at large, if uh, we promote the kind of values and uh, uh, belief systems that really lend to themselves towards, you know, protecting our young people, promoting healthy relationships and healthy lifestyles, you know, then, uh, you know, we're always going to have uh, an individual here or there who, you know, doesn't get the message, but 
by and large, people will you know, will get that and uh, behave themselves accordingly. And if they see the rewards, you know, like what you're talking about in terms of, you know, being people, you know, gratitude as it's expressed for for its helping out, you know, that makes it uh, the, the work that we do so much more gratifying. Uh, you know, I feel very blessed that I was able, I chose this career almost by happenstance. I was uh, a social work intern 35 years ago, looking for a placement. Luckily, I had a neighbor uh, down the hall who worked in what's now OASAS and uh, steered me to an internship there. And uh, I just really found my mission in life. And uh, I'm not a person in recovery. I, you know, grew up in the 60s and there was a lot going on and I <laughs> hardly purer than the driven snow when it comes to that. But uh, I was fortunate that maybe I was smart enough or just had enough of a sense of self-preservation to kind of know when to stop and not say, don't go too far with all this. But I did see uh, people around me, you know, close friends who didn't wound up in very bad places, dead, long time, long term prison sentences, uh, you know, uh, severe psychiatric problems, that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, uh, young people today, you know, they're growing up and they're seeing the same thing around them. So uh, it's up to us as the uh, adults to help them uh, provide them with the resources. And also didn't have a chance to mention this before, but I think Ronnie alluded to it and so did you. Uh, the whole issue of putting them in places where they get the kind of uh, in the kind of peer groups and settings where uh, they can support each other. We know that uh, young people very often look to their peers for uh, um, you know sharing their concerns and uh, getting uh, ideas about how to how to uh, conduct themselves. And if we create situations where young people can be in positive and strengthening peer environments then uh, we've gone a long way to help the, help them reach reach their goals really well said and, and just i mean so succinct and true and, and it, it sounds so simple but mm -hmm. it, it but i guess when we don't allocate the resources to do it and we don't make that our emphasis it becomes such a challenge um and you know speaking of challenges this last year or so has been a challenge but um, now coming out of the lockdown and all the craziness, what, what lies ahead for you in the near future? Well, one of the things that, you know, speaking of the challenge of the last year and one of the uh, certainly unexpected or unintended consequences that uh, came out of the pandemic is, um, uh, especially in the treatment world, is the emphasis on uh, uh, telehealth and the implementation of that. So many of the uh, folks who are receiving care have actually responded very positively to it and feel that it makes it easier for them to access uh, services. Uh, they're also not uh, going to, you know, they don't have to deal with the travel to go have conversation with their counselor and all the burden that places on them, not to mention not having to deal with uh, the urotoxicologies and conversations about it, medication dosages and so forth. Feel that in many cases that they've had a very, um, um, they have a much more rewarding experience. So uh, uh, that's uh, the, the whole growth of telehealth and, you know, because what we're doing right here in terms of Zoom calling has uh, um, um, provided a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges. And as we move forward now, we have to think about to what extent do we move strictly back into, a, you know, face-to-face -face issues? Do we come up with hybrid models and so forth? And that's, that's going to be a real challenge going for, forward, you know both in treatment and prevention settings, and also uh, within organizations themselves, whether uh, uh, one of the consortium that I belong to uh, uh, recently uh, was uh, suggest that maybe they would go back to uh, having in-person meetings. And actually the response was overwhelming towards, no, we like, we like being able to do this. It makes it easier for, easier for us to participate in these conversations because we don't have to worry about the travel and so forth. And uh, we're actually able to accomplish a lot more. So, uh, but you know, every every change in advance in technology uh, always poses a challenge. You think about, you know, what 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 life was like for people when the telephone was first introduced, or when uh, the desktop computer first came along. I was around with that one, and uh, it was very challenging for some of us at first to you know get used to the idea of uh, using a uh, uh, computer and things like email and so forth to communicate, but. You know, now it's almost hard to remember what life was like before they before those things existed. Uh, I remember not that long ago uh, when my kids were around cleaning out our attic and coming across an old typewriter and I was like, well, what is that thing exactly? <laughs> I said, that's what we relied on to communicate with each other. <laughs> you 
know, that's how I uh, wrote my papers in college. And, that's uh, right. <laughs> how we sent our letters and so forth. You know, it's uh, uh, it seems it seems like an eternity ago, but I think there's uh, a lot of good things happening, a lot of good conversations overall, again, around the issues of, you know, uh, uh, policy, how should we handle this, the challenges around allocating appropriate resources. You know, one of the conversations I was on this morning was the uh, issue of uh, what's going to happen with the opioid settlement funds that are coming into uh, New York State and uh, the need to try to create some sort of lockbox or dedicated fund for those uh, resources rather than having them simply swept into the general fund. Uh, because you know we we know that there's still there's there are a lot of resources that go to addiction services in New York. We're actually uh, very far ahead of many states in that regard uh, on a per capita basis. But that being said, there's certainly still a lot of need um, at all levels: harm reduction, prevention, treatment, recovery supports uh, to uh, really make an impact on people's lives. So uh, the 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 more we can make sure that those resources are there and that we can um, do the things we need to do to uh, make people's lives better, then uh, uh, the better off I think society as a whole is. It's unfortunately becomes very tempting. And, you know, again, I worked in government for 30 years. I, I understand this is that, um, you know, you see money's coming into the state coffers and you want to just sort of make them available for uh, general use. But, uh, and I don't think anyone in the executive always likes the idea of having your ability to use those funds restricted, but um, given the uh, size and scope of our addiction issues in New York State, and we've seen one of the sad thoughts is, is during COVID is a dramatic increase in opioid overdoses uh, around the state. Some areas, you know, major increases, close to 100%, just at the point where right before the pandemic, they were declining. Uh, and we're starting to actually have some impact between uh, education, the use of Narcan and so forth. And with the pandemic, all of a sudden those numbers started to spring back up. So we really need to do a lot more. Um, as, much, as much resources as we dedicate, there's still a need for a lot more. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, that says it all right there. And uh, unfortunately we are out of time, okay. but this has been such a great conversation with you today. And, you know, I think it's, it's good to hear people say, and, and you just kind of validated for me that even through all this darkness, we had some light and we had some things emerge that have really transformed how we do things. Uh, I know for us, that's been the case, but we want to thank you so much for being our guest today. And hopefully you'll come back and see us again. It would be my pleasure. It's always great talking with you and Javar and uh, love to you know share thoughts and ideas and uh, hear the stories that you have to tell. Uh, you, you both have a tremendous amount to contribute and thank you very much for all the work that you're doing because it's 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 great work and very important work. Can we ask one last question? By all means. One last question. I was waiting. <laughs> one okay. last question. Growing up as a young individual, what did you want to be when you get up, when you, when, when, when you were a youngster, what did you want to be when you got older? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, probably when I was very young, you know, I, my dad was an attorney. I thought that might be a, a profession I'd be interested in. You know, it's not uncommon that, you know, boys want to emulate a, a parent and so forth. Later on, I had a lot of thoughts about uh, going into the academic world. I have a very, I have a very strong interest in things like cultural anthropology. And, uh, you know, I like the idea of being able to think great thoughts and, you know, have uh, great intellectual discussions with someone. But somewhere along the line, I realized that, you know what, I wanted to find a very practical way to put my uh, ideas into practice and to use them, to use my skills to help people. And I was very fortunate to have an amazing uh, partner, my wife, who, uh, Renee, who uh, gave me some guidance along the way and talked to me about uh, ways I could do, I could do that through things like social work and so forth. And uh, that led me into the career I wound up with, and I have not an ounce of regret over it. I think uh, it's been a great career, and I look forward to continuing it in my new phase of life. Uh, there's still still a little bit of bite left in this old dog, so I need to stay in the fight as long as I can. Go ahead, you Thank you for asking. <laughs> no, I was going to say thank you. Thank you for sharing. You know, okay. that was great. You know, again, you were a wonderful guest. We want you back. Uh, so I we continue this conversation here. about trauma and a couple of other things. We had a different meeting a week, a couple of weeks ago, which I would like to talk about. But I'll say that for the for the next in the next episode. That would be great.
All right. Well, thank you so much for coming by. And now uh, Shavar and I are going to stick around and finish out the show uh, while, you, while you're signing off. But uh, we'll see you again soon. That, be, that would be my pleasure. Thank you, Ronnie. And thank you, Shavar. It's great seeing right, you. Take care, Steve. Be well. Okay. Bye. Bye. That was cool. a lot of good stuff. A lot of, good stuff. a lot of good stuff, especially around trauma, around youth. Uh, and we touched a lot. You know, uh, there's some things I wish we could have got more time to talk about. Was it? I, I just like listening to them talk. I like listening to our guests talk and hear their perspectives on particular things. You know, even him understanding, like you know, me sharing about what trauma meant to a person like me growing up. Like it wasn't. Wasn't a real, it wasn't a real thing unless you went to the hospital <laughs> right. or an injury, <laughs> nothing else. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't even know what trauma was growing up and, and how much of it I had, I had experienced in my life. And a lot of times we don't want to accept that right. uh, because people have looked upon it in the past, at least, as something really negative and, and kind of impairs who you are. But that's mm -hmm. not the case at all. And we, it's become a lot more accepted and we're understanding it more mm -hmm. and more. But maybe we can do a show just, you know, one episode de devoted to really exploring trauma and uh, mm -hmm. its development as, you know, over the years and in people's lives and, mm -hmm. you know, where we are with it today. I agree. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank the listeners and the viewers. I know. And it's good to be back. And, uh, and you know, hopefully we're going to get more on track. Uh, I have a feeling we're not, well, next week's the New England uh, Institute of Prediction Studies Summer School. But the week after that, hopefully we will be back and uh, be talking more about Pride and about NYC Pop and all the work we're doing. Well, this has been the solution. Nothing changes. We change nothing. Don't forget to subscribe. Oh, don't. Please don't. <laughs> and comment. Please comment. <laughs> we'll see you soon. <laughs>